and peace. From God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our consideration this morning is the first lesson we heard a few minutes ago. It's found in Exodus chapter 6, beginning at verse 2. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. This is the word of our Lord. In the name of him who promises and fulfills all of his gracious promises to us in his son Jesus. Dear friends, one day this will all be yours. That's what his father promised him. He promised his little boy that the family business would one day be his. His grandpa had started it over half a century earlier, and what had started out as just a, a small local company had grown to a global enterprise. Several factories, large office buildings, thousands of employees, millions and millions of dollars of annual sales, and it was all going to be his one day. That's what his father told him. That's what he promised. He kept hearing that same promise all his life. And he couldn't wait till it was his, just as Dad promised. But as the years went by, the, the promise seemed to grow dim. The chances of it being fulfilled seemed to grow almost non-existent. You see, the, the, the products that company made became obsolete. Technology moved in a different direction. Soon nobody was buying anything they made. Employees were laid off. Factories were shuttered, office buildings were sold, and finally by the time the little boy had grown up to an adult, the company had declared bankruptcy. So much for that promise, huh? All that was left of that promise was empty dreams, unfulfilled hopes, broken promises. One day, all this will be yours. That's what God said to a man by the name of Abraham. But he wasn't talking about a business. He was talking about a land, the land of Canaan. God promised to Abraham that one day that land would be the possession of Abraham's descendants, a nation, the nation of Israel. But as the years went by, it seemed as if that promise was growing dimmer and the chances of it being fulfilled growing fainter. About 150 years after God made that promise to Abraham, Abraham's descendants, now numbering in the hundreds, were forced to leave Canaan and go down to Egypt because of a famine. And while they were kept safe, ultimately they ended up being prevented from leaving Egypt. Their numbers kept growing as the years went by, became becoming centuries. There were over a million of them, but they were stuck there, enslaved by the Egyptians with no seemingly no hope of being able to go back to the land God had promised them. How many of those people who were recipients of the promise began to lose hope? Then a little glimmer of hope took place when God called one of those descendants of Abraham, the man by the name of Moses, about 300 years after God had promised Abraham that that land would be the possession of his descendants. And he called on Moses to go to the Pharaoh and demand that he release the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And so he did just that, albeit reluctantly. But of course, Pharaoh didn't listen. In fact, he, he pretty much did the opposite. Instead of letting them go, releasing them from slavery, he made their lives as slaves even worse. That one of their main jobs as slaves in Egypt was to make bricks for the uh, amazing building projects that the Egyptians had going on. 
At first, they were given everything they needed to make bricks, the clay, the tools, and perhaps most important of all, the straw that was mixed in with the clay to, to reinforce and strengthen the bricks. But after Moses demanded that those people be released from their slavery, the, the Pharaoh told them, from now on, guess what? You have to find your own straw. You have to go out into the fields and cut it. And oh, by the way, I'm not reducing your quota of bricks. You've got to make the same number of bricks. So now their lives in Egypt, which had been bad, became virtually impossible. And so Moses snapped. And he lashed out at God. In the verses just before our lesson this morning, he confronted God with an accusation. He said, is this why you've called me to do this? Why have you brought this trouble on these people? Moses couldn't understand it. God made a promise, but God sure didn't seem to be living up to that promise. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever snapped at God? Maybe not in words, but at least in thought and attitude. Have you ever found yourself doubting that God could keep the promises that he makes to you? Have you ever looked around at your life and, and, and felt like God isn't living up to his end of the bargain? If so, join the club. It's a big club. It's a club that consists of people like Moses, believers like Job in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, apostles like Thomas, and really every other person, every other man, woman, and child who has been brought to faith in Christ and bears the name of Christ finds ourselves at least sometimes doubting God's promises maybe becoming angry at God because it doesn't seem like he's keeping those promises. Sometimes it's the things that happen in life that seem to get in the way of God keeping his promises. Think of the problems that we encounter in our own lives, the, the health problems, the financial problems, the relationship problems. Ultimately, though, it's the sin problem that really threatens to get in the way of God keeping his promise to us, huh? I mean, God promises that our sins are all forgiven, but then we go and do something that we know is wrong and sinful and against God, and then we wonder and we worry, did God really love me? And is he really going to keep that promise of forgiveness? How could he? Why would he? The things that, that cause us to doubt God's promises and his ability to keep them come from a variety of sources, outside and inside, but ultimately they come from the devil himself. Remember how he started back in Eden? At God had made some promises to Adam and Eve that if they continued to obey him as his loving children, he would bless them. And then the serpent, the devil, said, did God really say that? And he keeps whispering those words in our ears today. Did God really say that? Does he really mean it? Is he really going to do it? Because I don't think so. But God answers those doubts. He answered Moses. In the words of our lesson this morning, here's his answer to Moses' accusation that God wasn't fulfilling his promises. He didn't back away. He didn't make excuses. He didn't modify his promise and, and, and kind of scale it back a little bit. In fact, he did the opposite. He, he doubled down on his promise. He doubled down on the promise that he would release his people from slavery. He really would, that they would be his special people and he would take them back to that place that he had promised that they would live. And most important of all, that the Savior that he had promised would be born there. But he didn't just repeat his promise. He backed it up. 
He backed it up in a very unique way. Maybe you caught that as you listened to the words of that first lesson this morning, how God bracketed his response to Abraham with a phrase, with words. He said, I am the Lord. And then he went on to, make his, to repeat his promise. I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So how does that back up his promise? Why does that repeated phrase, I am the Lord, have anything to do with God keeping his promises? Well, maybe you've caught this before. Maybe you noticed it this morning if you were following along and reading as I spoke these words. But that, that, that name, Lord, as we see it in our lesson this morning and as we see it in many, 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 many places in the Old Testament, it was spelled just a little bit different than we would expect. In our English translations of the Bible, it's spelled with all capital letters. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Did you ever notice that? Do you wonder why? Well, there's a reason for that. The translators of our modern English Bibles are, are trying to reflect in that spelling with all capitalization what the original Hebrew of the Old Testament said. See, that was a special name for God. It was pronounced Yahweh, except God's people didn't pronounce it. The Israelites felt that that name for God was, was so special and so holy, they didn't even want to have it pass through their lips. They felt they were so unworthy, they couldn't even pronounce that word. So when they came to that word Yahweh, they would instead substitute a different Hebrew word, a more common Hebrew word. The Hebrew word that's pronounced Adonai, but means Lord. And so that's what our Bible translations have tried to do for us in English, to, to make us realize that th this is that special name for God, this holy covenant name, Lord. Yahweh literally means I am. God was saying in that name that He is sovereign, He is eternal. He keeps His promises. That name, Lord, is the, the name of God's grace, His covenant, His promise name, the name that says, I am the one who, who, who graciously makes and keeps all of these promises. A special name. He, he even pointed out to Moses that that wasn't the name he used when he talked to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, in Hebrew, El Shaddai, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. God Almighty, a name that, that conveys his power, but the Lord that conveys his love and his ability to keep his promises. I am the Lord, he says. That's how he backed up his promises. But as they say, the proof is in the pudding, right? So did he do it? You know he did. You know how the story ends, don't you? He did keep his promise to release his people from slavery in Egypt. He did it with, with, with a series of plagues that decimated the Egyptians. He did it by parting the Red Sea so they could cross and then wiping out Pharaoh's entire army. He did it by miraculously preserving them for 40 years as they wandered in the wilderness despite their unfaithfulness and grumbling against God. He did it by settling them back in that land he had promised so many centuries earlier. And then he did it about 1,500 years later in that same land when Jesus was born, the Messiah, the Savior, the eternal, <coughs> the eternal Son of God. God keeps his promises, every last one of them. He kept his promises to the Israelites. He kept his promise to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and all the rest. And he keeps his promises to us. 
And God loves nothing more than for His children to hold Him to those promises, to remember them and say to Him, keep those promises, God, keep them. But let's also be very careful that we don't try to hold God to promises He doesn't make. God doesn't promise that our lives are always going to be easy, that there will be no problems or challenges or pain in our lives. He didn't promise that to the Israelites. He doesn't promise that to us either. In fact, he warned our first parents the opposite because of the sin that people brought into this world. <clears throat> there will be problems and pain and hardship. But here is what he promises. He promises, I am with you always. To the very end of the age. He promises, I will make all things work for your good. Every one of them, even the bad things. He promises, all your sins have been forgiven. They're gone. They're forgotten. You are my dearly loved child. And he promises. He points us to heaven and says, one day, this will all be yours. In fact, it already is. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand.